So, the science, the fan frets, like you're merging the, the, the piano into what, what the violins can do. What does that actually mean for the layman? So, these fan frets, if I'm gonna hit this B string versus the top string. Sure. W what is that adding to this guitar? Well, um, to put it in, in layman's terms, and um, this is a communication tool. So let's, let's pretend we're in a band here, and you're our audience. Um, Great audience. You look fantastic. Saskatoon! The best audience. Yeah, Saskatoon! You guys. All right, so yeah. right now we're communicating to yeah. you, and, and I'm using my, my voice, and I'm communicating through a microphone, and you're understanding what I'm saying, hopefully. But if I was going to play an instrument, I'd be communicating with my fingertips. And so everything that my fingertips touch somehow has to get into these two eardrums of, of everybody out there and trigger an emotion. That's, that's really amazing that, that a musician can affect everyone in this audience um, on an emotional level with just their fingertips. So we create the tools that allow them to do that. And uh, I'm going to cover my mouth right now yep. and illustrate what a traditional bass does and how easy it is to communicate. So I'm going to talk for a while. Can anybody understand what I'm saying? Not really. It's, it's masked. And that would be the sound of a, of a traditional instrument. And what we've done is we've just sort of removed the, the, the muffle and we've made it so that people can hear so much more clearly what the bass player is doing. And their audiences respond to it. And producers that produce albums with our instruments on it, uh, we've had them come and look us up and, and go, man, I just wanted to shake your hand. I just recorded one of your basses and it was like the best experience ever. So. You know, when you think about it, tradition is great, but everything else in the world has moved forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a, a gaming system in the 1950s when a traditional guitar was developed was, what was a gaming system? It was a ball and a glove. Yeah. What was or a monopoly, home, maybe. Yeah, what was a home entertainment system? Yeah. It was a 12-inch TV with a mono speaker. Everything else in the entertainment industry has just, like, grown by leaps and bounds, and yet guitarists are still sort of bound to the 50s with their guitar choices, and we're, we're providing an option that's, that's more up-to-date, that keeps, keeps in step with uh, modern entertainment. Well, it's, it's a beautiful guitar, and it sounds incredible. I've heard it, and you guys have heard it too, believe it or not, without even knowing. So, we talked a little bit about it. So, you've, you started, there's the fire, then you feel this pressure, that you're in this niche market, but potentially this isn't where you should be. You should be in the regular standard four-string bass players. That's all they want. Those four strings, straight cut. You cave for that pressure. Yeah, we've been from the from the very get-go. It's been it's been an uphill struggle, and it, and it feels like well, we are. We're bucking tradition. We're going against the the grain. Um, and there came a point where it was just like, you know, why? Why, why do this? And the feedback we were getting from the dealers was, well, you're too radical, you're, you're, you're too ahead of your time, you know, do something more traditional. Um, and so we said, okay, that's what we'll do. You know, we're not proud, we have to, I like to eat. <laughs> yeah. So we'll do what, what the market wants, what the dealers tell us that we should be doing. And then a magazine article came out that uh, listed us as one of the 10, um, uh, best innovations of the last 10 years. We've actually had that happen a couple of times. Magazines have been really supportive of us. Considering we rarely advertise, we've had better press than anybody I can think of. Um, and they've actually, probably because of them, we've, we're able to do what we do um, because of their support. Uh, so long story short, they listed us, uh, listed us as one of the, the most important innovations of, of the previous decade, and that sort of kick-started interest back in what we're doing, and, and it's been steady growth ever since. So the, the article comes out, you're going to a trade show, top 10 influence, like most influential changes in the music industry on the bass. Yeah. You're one of them, Dingwall Basses, out of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. But you've already jumped off that bandwagon and started building the classic guitars. Spent a year developing this retro instrument, and I built two of them, and and, and my heart was in it, because we were offering something that I knew could be better if we would just stick to our guns. 
And so uh, uh, we decided, you know what? We took orders for it that we never fulfilled because it just, you know, it, we just couldn't do it in a clear conscience. Yeah. See, so you're, you're one of the entrepreneurs in the, in the room that we all privately hate. Because you're one of the guys that when my dad told me, just do what you love and you'll be happy and the money will follow. Yeah, that's a danger. Never happened to me. <laughs> Never happened. If I could somehow make money following Pearl Jam, I'd be a billionaire by now. But I am broke and merch is expensive. So how did you make a living out of doing something you love doing? You know, I, uh, the, the term starving artist is... It, 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 came from the fact that every artist starves, uh, <laughs> and I started, and I was willing to give up, uh, I was willing to give up a wage, I was willing to work for free, I still work for free, uh, every day I go to work, and I get to work with beautiful woods, I get to work with uh, things that I love, and um, I would absolutely do it for free. Yeah. That being said, <laughs> I was going to say, I want to punch you right in the face. That being, that being said, my wife would not yeah, allow me to do it for free. Uh, you know, I have to pay rent. I have to live in Saskatoon. I have employees that have families. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's 20 years of just of just being stubborn and just saying we're going to do it my way. I'm going to. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I'm just going to keep plugging away. We've been able to, without reach being focused on it, we've been able to build a brand, and with brand comes trust, and with trust yep. comes customers that are willing to go, okay, I'll give you a shot. Yeah. And um, it, it's, it's funny, as it's sort of snowballed, the doors that were impossible to push open 20 years ago now are kind of like, oh, they're opening with much less effort. We're still not uh, in every city out there. Um, but you know, the, the beauty of, of dealing in so many different countries is we don't have to be a hit product in every single city. You know, we're a small company. We can, we can sell 10 guitars into Iceland and 10 into Russia and 10 and 100 into the UK and, and 50 to Australia and another couple hundred to Japan and another couple hundred to, well, guess what? That's our years worth of business. Yeah. And totally global from Saskatoon. Yeah, we were global within, I was still working at Earl's and I was, I was exporting to the U.S. Crazy. Yeah. What did you do at Earl's? I was a waiter. Yeah, so was I. I used to be a waiter here. Really? Hey, wait at a minute. John's? Yeah. Yeah. I remember you. Do you? From Earl's. <laughs> yeah, that's a good memory. I, I was much handsomer then. You can fly past the interview. Get it? They check you out when you walk in, Earl's. Trust me, trust me, they did back in the 90s. They checked us out before they did just hire Joe Blows. They hired attractive men <laughs> with heads of hair. Yeah, you'd never know it, but yeah. Yeah, you'd still be good. I, they would, I would be doing the dishes. Not that there's anything wrong with that, kids. You can do dishes. But nowadays, I'd be in the dishes. So you're working at Earl's, you're selling globally. The question everybody has been asking me for the last couple weeks about Sheldon Dingwall, what albums is his base on? So oh, man. I, I, I didn't, I don't, I haven't micromanaged it that much. I know a little bit about it because I know some of your main guys, like I was saying before, Lee Sklar, who's a, a huge studio musician, like played on, what's some stuff he's played on? He's probably the most recorded. Yeah, he is, player. isn't he? I thought he was the most recorded bass player in the history. Probably. Her, him and maybe Carol Kay and, okay. and James Jamerson. Um, but Lee has played on 40,000 songs. Uh, he's used our bass on the Oscars, on the American Music Awards with um, Aretha Franklin. Um, Nickelback's used them on the American Music Awards. So. There isn't anybody here for sure who hasn't heard our bass. Yeah. Because it's been on Rod Stewart and Ricky Skaggs, La Love It, uh, Willie Nelson. I've been this far from Willie Nelson's bum. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank God this is televised because I got so much running through my head. Well, 
we're, we're taking a bass to the studio and it's Willie's session and, and uh, so we got invited into the control room to listen to the take and I wanted to be out of the way so I went behind the console and I sat down on, on a ledge and then this guy stands right in front of me so I got this bum right in my face and I thought man that's really rude and I looked down and on his sneakers, he had him embroidered with Willie on him. I thought, oh, okay, so. <laughs> cool. Sorry, it's, you can stand wherever you want, sir. Yeah. See, I, I've had a brief Willie experience, and it wasn't a, it wasn't a bum experience. There's a so joke in there somewhere. The, no, there isn't, actually. The, he, he's got a place in Paella, in Maui. He's got a little, like, hotel and kind of pool hall. Some of you might have been there. I see some people will wave. And I went in there one day, and just because they said, yeah, sometimes he's there. And I'm not a huge Willie Nelson fan, but I love music, so hence I'm a huge Willie Nelson fan. He's a cool guy, too. He's a big, like, he's a big deal, Willie Nelson. Yeah. Sure enough, I walk in, and he was drinking a, Bud, a Budweiser, I think. <laughs> and he was playing pool with just random guys. I didn't say hi to him. I didn't get a picture with him. With Willie, it's all about the Bud. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you 